Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thanks again to coming out to Cyber and Security Defense in Depth. James, how are things going? Everything's going great. Uh, how, how have you been, Brandon? Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thanks again to come out to. Thanks, James. Yeah, you have the video on the background. Everything's going great. Uh... So, yeah. Uh, thank you, everyone, for showing up. I just wanted to let you guys know we have a great event going on tonight. A lot of uh, information we're going to be covering today. Uh, I think, James, did you fix that? I did. Thank you. <laughs> There, there you go. So yeah, James was watching watching uh, one of his YouTube videos this morning or this afternoon. Uh, so yeah, we're That's gonna be having great. a lot of a uh, great conversation about you know file security, uh, what's going on with CW and the encryption. Uh, we also have another colleague that's here that's going to be talking about their organization, uh, Michael Fishman. And I'm not sure if his colleague, Brandon, is going to be on, but I know Michael's going to be doing his presentation. We're going to be jumping to that. So James, any news you want to share? Uh, what's going on in the industry? Uh, overall, I think we keep seeing a lot of change that happens in the industry, but uh, been following YouTube and uh, LinkedIn quite a bit about the chatter that's going on there. And it's really quite amazing to see the attacks still happening worldwide, people still struggling, trying to figure it all out. Uh, now the new things with uh, quantum resiliency and encryption, uh, and people are scrambling to try to create the new solution that will protect hackers from stealing data. It, it, it's really quite scary to watch uh, with all of the uh, global concerns with this right now. But you know, it, it's going to take people like us and other organizations to get the word out there and allow people to make make themselves aware that there are ways in order to fix things. It's not going to be immediate but we are going to get there and we'll do it safely. For sure. Now, guys, uh, everyone that's watching, thank you so much for coming out. Uh, let us know where you're from and then what area of cybersecurity are you interested in? So uh, just post in the chat. Uh, this can be a live session, so it's going to be live and recorded. So if you guys have any questions as we're going out, please, you know, let them go. We spoke to the, the speakers and the presenters. They're going to want to know your questions in real time. Uh, just to make sure you got the information that you need from today's session. Uh, so yeah, let's get started. I'm going to introduce uh, the event and today's presentation and what we'll be talking about today. Uh, just give me a second here. It's up here. There we go. So yeah, tonight uh, we have Michael Fishman and his colleague, Brandon uh, Virgin, but Michael will be actually doing the presenting today. Uh, I'll give you a, a little bit of their bio uh, just to kind of give you an idea. Just give me a second here and bring this back up. So there's going to be two presentations today. Uh, there's going to be an update as well from uh, C Dave from CW. Uh, this meeting is meetup is live streamed and recorded. So you can actually watch this later uh, and share it with your colleagues and your friend. Our Q and a is live. So if you have any questions, anything that you want to get any information, let us know. Uh, we'll do our best to answer and make sure that we can give you the most relevant information with defense and depth in mind. So to give you a little bit of idea about our speakers, we've got Michael Fishman. He's the COO. Uh, after working on the space shuttle program for six years, Michael moved into the management consulting world and has been running his company for over 20 years uh, with over 100 consultants. Uh, he has worked with Fortune Fortune 100 companies, helped them improve their operations and design solutions to better meet their customers' needs. He recently started and, and sold an analytics company which developed technology to improve uh, observatory uh, and for uh, unstructured data environment. And then Brandon, his colleague, uh, CTO, over 20 years of networking and industry experience and holds a uh, patent for working on normalizing network performance index indexes. He's helped uh, he helped to architect several of the world's largest networks. He's achieved his CCIE in August of 2000. And then Brandon was a founding member of the Analytics Center of Excellence, the ACE, ACE at Cisco Systems, using predictive analytics internally at Cisco to enhance the services line of business. And then Brandon was the CTO of the company. He and Michael recently sold, being the architecture of network performance and security solutions. So th they're going to be providing some really good information. Uh, give me a second here 
on cybersecurity and just, you know, a lot of great information. So I'm going to first bring in Dave. Uh, Dave's got some updates when it comes to CEW uh, before we go into the ODEX uh, presentation. Hey, Dave, how's it going? Very good. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Brandon. Thanks, James, for inviting me in. I, I do want to just give a, a small uh, update on CEW Systems uh, Canada and our bisymmetric hybrid encryption software that is available and rolling out the door. Um, we have just released version 2.1 which uh, in, incorporates a password manager. And I'll be talking a bit more about that shortly. But I, I want everybody to be aware that encryption software is to protect your data, not to stop hackers. That, that's not the purpose of encryption software. We can't close doors. That's companies like Musato and other penetration testing methods to find your holes and, and stop the penetration that is happening. But we all know that, I mean, just look at the news, all, all the amount of hacking that's going on. We do know that, you know, networks and computers are being hacked and data is being stolen. Our software protects that data. Should it be breached? Should you, should you be breached and the data is taken? That data is of no consequence to anybody. They cannot read it. They cannot decipher it. They cannot break it. And with that, I'm uh, pleased to announce that uh, the National Research Council reached out to us and a, uh, a peer for a peer review and uh, took our software and gave it to the Saskatchewan Polytechnical Digital Integration Center of Excellence at the Saskatchewan Polytechnical Institute. Uh, the purpose was to review everything, to say, uh, to find out if we were truthful in everything we were claiming and saying. And I'm pleased to announce that um, the group headed by Dr. Sorrell Capel has just issued us back the peer review. And I'm going to read three to four uh, main paragraphs from this report. Uh, I will just be reading it because that's what you have to do with a peer re uh, review. I can't just summarize it. I have to read it. Not the whole thing, just uh, some of the key uh, paragraphs. Now, this paper is on our website at cew-s.com. You can review it uh, in full. And then once I read this and tell you what uh, great news is, um, uh, we'll talk about our new announcement. Uh, at this point, I do want to just publicly uh, acknowledge and thank the National Research Council of Canada for coming to us and saying we want to test your software. And of course, they funded the uh, DICE, uh, the Digital Integration Center of Excellence, um, to do this work. And Dr. Capel has, has finished it. He finished it last week, and I'm very pleased. So I'm going to talk uh, about a couple of the, the main points that he brought out. So reading from his paper, um, Quoted, uh, bisymmetric encryption uses a unique and no novel handshake, need the glasses, <laughs> incorporating encrypted session key combinations, allowing user login credentials, biometric data, credit card data, and or command activation codes to be quickly and correctly processed without directly transmitting the confidential data. That is unique to our software and nobody on the market has been able to do this. Uh, continuing, the plug-and-play hybridized encryption system employs concepts like asymmetric encryption meshed with more secure symmetric encryption. A significant difference from commonly employed asymmetric encryption is that during the initial handshake to set up the communication, no vulnerable data is exchanged. Should the sender key communicate be intercepted by a hacker, they still cannot pretend to be the originator of the communications to the receiver. And that is the uh, most important thing that we have been striving to do. Um, and we, we finalized that in version two. And then, as I said, we're at 2.1 right now. Uh, continuing on his report, he, he says that the encryption itself is uh, achieved by randomly generating keys and interweaving them with portions of unencrypted data to be transmitted, applied to single bytes of data rather than long bytes collect, uh, byte collections like most companies do. During the initial handshake, private keys are generated from and found in the form of login credentials, credit card information, biometric data, or other personal cr uh, credential information or pre-shared private keys, which are then used to start the handshake and are never actually transmitted. Randomly gen generated data in the form of challenge codes, counter challenge codes, and session keys are exchanged during this handshake. This allows for the client and server to ascertain that the communicator at the other end are who they say they are. Once a, satisfy, a client is satisfied that the server is who they believe it to be by the server properly modifying the client challenge code and sending it back, and the server is satisfied the client is who they say they are 
again, by correctly modifying and sending back the server challenge code, a fully encrypted session is established. Communications can proceed. During the regular portion of the session, data are encrypted multiple times in a specific way that only the correct receiver can decrypt the communications directly. Mathematical, are, mathematical formulas are not used for encryption decryption. Instead, algorithmic protocols are used. The multiple levels of interweaving together with the various encrypted bytes become new data sets which are fully transmitted to the receiver who then reverses the whole process to decrypt the message. CEW has always been that we will not use math formulas for our encryption system. That is what supercomputers and definitely quantum computers can break. So what we have been claiming and the National Research Council, you know, challenged us on this is our, our software is quantum resilient. We will not say quantum proof because nobody's put it on a quantum computer to test it, but we are claiming it to be quantum resilient, which Dr. Capel continues to go on in his uh, report to prove that we are correct and everything we say is correct. Reading a little further, we have the bisymmetric encryption system is intended to, uh, for use in various levels of security requirements. Bluetooth levels use the smallest packet sizes, shortest key lengths, and the least amount of interweaving. The intended content for this level is to use a keyless lock entry, uh, like a car fob, or other Bluetooth-based communications devices, uh, typical for private use uh, applications and IoT devices, uh, which is one of our announcements. We are now going to protect home IoT devices from hackers so they cannot get your usernames and passwords. I continue on his report. Commercial applications form the next level of security robustness. These applications would include virtually any kind of transaction conducted over the internet, whether it be for interaction with one's bank, credit card account, or making online purposes. Again, that was one of our main objectives to protect internet purchases to stop credit card fraud. Continuing along, he says the highest level of security robustness, uh, robustness <laughs> includes government and military applications. The, this level of security is many factors more complex than either commercial or Bluetooth applications. In all cases, the inherent complexity, uh, complexity of hacking the message by determining keys is many magnitudes greater than the current standard internet encryption protocols, all of which are considered secure against present standard supercomputers. We're not even talking your ordinary computer. Um, we have created three different levels of encryption, one for consumers, one commercial, one for military. Uh, our military grade is 16 intertwined levels of encryption. That interweaving, that's what CEW stands for, is compound inter interweaving. Uh, <laughs> oh, it's been a long day. Uh, it's, it's, <laughs> let me take a sec. A compound encryption weaving, the CEW, is something that's never been done before. And in the military version, that is 16 levels of encryption interweaved together, making for quintillion zeros of possible combinations that a supercomputer would have to decipher to get the correct key. And if you can get the key, then you can break anything, of course, but uh, it's, it's almost impossible. So he goes on to say, it may seem contrary, the overhead processing of the bisymmetric encrypted message does not add significant delays to encryption and decryption, decryption as reported by CEW during a series of runtime tests. This seems reasonable. One understands that instead of processing large byte sets in encrypted blocks, the system encrypts small blocks, but with large sets of keys. Thus processing is very fast while still secure. This is why the CEW white paper calls the system the fastest, smallest, and largest, which has been tested to standard AES uh, um, reporting, and we have basically topped the list with the smallest, fastest, and largest. Uh, our, 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 our processing times are uh, in the neighborhood of only 17% of the standard processing types to do it takes to encrypt um, some software. So we're very pleased with that. And Dr. Capella has agreed that that is absolutely 100 correct. The last couple of paragraphs I want to talk about is much has been explored is what he says about ways in which the bisymmetric encryption handshake is ideally suited for encrypting pay for use e-commerce transaction. Consistent with all communications, the customer's account information is never actually transmitted. The customer's username, ID number, or database lookup index number is sent as salted encrypted data so the server, the server can look up the customer's account. 
The use of a database lookup index number allows a database server to access a user account more quickly without having to do a database query search. That makes us the fastest. Uh, and the final note, um, going further into this system is that he concludes the new and novel bisymmetric encryption system reviewed here offers multi-level quantum resilient encryption technology that has been significantly designed to be immune to brute force attacks, man in the middle attacks and roll jam attacks. Wherein other encryption programs only provide a token key exchange or two factor authentication, the bisymmetric encryption system is designed with an exponentially leveled multi factor authentication system. That's where I'm referring to the 16 different levels for the military version. The bisymmetric encryption handshake allows for pre shared private keys, login credentials, and command codes to be processed by a receiving device or server without the need to transmit the data directly. Bisymmetric encryption is designed to be embedded within electronic devices such as the Internet of Things, auto automotive remote keyless systems, autonomous uh, systems such as driverless vehicles, as well as being ideally suited for online, online downloading of keys to allow smart devices to be used by vehicle owners to connect to their vehicles. This is, he was asked to look at uh, how this could be used for automotive. Through integration with online retailers, credit card companies, and financial institutions, a higher level of security can be achieved for the millions of transactions that occur daily over the internet. Uh, we are so pleased that uh, Dr. Capel has uh, done a huge amount of testing on this product and he has concurred that everything we have seen is true. We are the fastest, largest and, and quickest and every, all that great stuff and we are quantum resilient. So we're very pleased about that. Uh, the last thing is our version 2.1 included a password manager, and that password manager allows our system to create a 96-character highly encrypted password that is stored on the receiving server. You do not have to memorize that 96 uh, password. In fact, you can continue to use your silly little password like password, but a hacker will, one, never be able to read it, and uh, even if they get into the data server, the 96 character password is based on a number of different things. So if you sit down at a different computer, it will not work. You have to have our password manager to be able to use it at a different computer. So a hacker could get your password, even though it's 96 characters long, it will not work from their computers. Our announcement today is we are packaging the password manager separately and will be on the market within a month. And it will be available for anybody who wants to download and install it from anywhere from commercial, consumer, all the way up to military. There is no key strokes on your computer to make this work. It is all graphic. Uh, it's very simple to use. It's very quick. Uh, and um, that's how we're going to get away from the keystroke malware is that watch what you're typing and then try and use your passwords elsewhere. Um, this also has been tested in, uh, by the, uh, the Digital Integration Center of Excellence, and they have approved it as being something that we should have marketed separately. So today we're announcing we are marketing it separately. So for those who do not the high level do not lead, need our high level military encryption, um, you can uh, buy the consumer and commercial versions, uh, which do not include this, and then add on the password manager. Um, if you just want the ma password manager to save your passwords, uh, wow, this is a great system, and that's going to be very inexpensive. And I said it'll be digitally downloaded and purchased online within about a month. And gentlemen, that's all I got today. We are thrilled by having uh, a peer review of our product that uh, uh, you know test everything we said it does and uh, yeah it's been proven to be exactly what we say we we are doing and we can't wait to uh, hear more from military now uh, as we have sent this uh, white paper out that's perfect Dave thank you so much uh, so the people that are here that are using it right now or, or looking for encryption what's the best way for them to contact you well, right now we have a number of things. If you're going through uh, military or any other high government, um, you know, I would suggest that you contact the TCU Alliance, which is the three of us working together. Uh, if you want just more information, contact CEW directly. You can get hold of us at contact at cew-s.com. And myself, Chad, or any anybody else, uh, uh, the team will be very happy to respond to those inquiries and, and um, we'll take it from there. So, but if it's military, um, well, you can still contact us, but we'd be bringing in uh, our TCU Alliance to uh, to work on those uh, those requests. 
Perfect. Well, yeah, thank you so much, David. Now, guys, I know you guys are asking questions about the report. I gave the, the, the link actually in the uh, YouTube channel. If you guys need it, let us, let me know. Uh, I can send it out to the actually anyone that's watching. If you're on Twitch, uh, Facebook, or you're on, on uh, YouTube, I can send that link out to all you guys. So let me know if you need it. Uh, again, look at CW. It's one of the more innovative encryption that are out there right now. A lot of companies are looking at data protection, so and how to secure their data at rest, as well as in motion. So this is important that at least you know it's out there. So if you you as a cybersecurity professional, organization, you know, government, military are looking at this, something to investigate because one of the most important things we're going to be talking about this a little bit later is file protection and data protection. So, David, thank you so much. Thank you, welcome. Anytime. I look forward to listening to our guests now. Awesome. So, James, you ready for our first presentation? I most certainly am. Looking forward to it. Okay. So, our first presentation, uh, that will be myself. We're actually going to do a presentation for ODEX. Uh, ODEX was an, it's an organization that's overseas, and they weren't able to make it, so they asked us as the presenters to be able to present uh, their technology. Something that I think you guys should be aware of too when it comes to protecting your data, especially when it goes into motion and looking at you know all the phishing attacks, all the scams that are happening along that line. So looking at how you can dissect your, your, your data to be able to look at file protection, malware, uh, anything that, that might be embedded into your software. This is actually a great, a great one to, to look at and at least to, to investigate for your organization. So uh, let me first get into it. Now, if you guys have any questions as we go, make sure you, you ask. Uh, I'm here to answer any questions about this and then also redirect you to the organization uh, for anything that's a little bit more technical. So just give me a second here. I'm just going to pull this back up. So yeah, so we're gonna go about what what ODEX, uh, about ODEX, the prom ODEX is addressing uh, their file wall, a cloud email security supplement, uh, CESS, uh, service launch and go to market strategy, the roadmap, and then just a little bit of a summary. So again, if you guys have any questions as we go, please, please let me know. So product por uh, portfolio, uh, as we were kind of looking at, James and I were looking at their, their software and what the solutions they provide. You can see they have a depth of different technologies. Uh, one uh, you're going to see in the base there, the product portfolio is based on true CDR, uh, core technology, which basically stands for content disarm and reconstruction. So basically what that means is they take your data, doesn't matter what file type it is, they, they deconstruct it to see the original source of the file, and then they reconstruct it and send it back to the uh, that original source. So if it's a Word, a JPEG, a PNG file, whatever that may be, they're sending it back to you clean, right? It's been sanitized. So uh, you can see they have a kiosk sanitizer, they have a net folder, they have a mail scanner, they have a client, uh, they have an API. Uh, right now their integration is with Office 365 and Microsoft products. And we're gonna see later on the roadmap, you're gonna see how they're developing out to look at the different suites of Microsoft products. Uh, here, uh, now you see in, in their presentation, they're actually pulling and they're actually showing that their file wall, not firewall, it's something that we were talking about earlier, but it's a firewall. It's a native plugin from Outlook's attach attachment that's sanitized. So you can actually embed it as you download it, embed it into your Outlook tool, and then be able to scan your files as you get emails. And then all of us have been very well aware of like phishing attacks and things along that line to be aware of. So now it can actually scan in your inbox and make sure these, these document documents have been sanitized that you're not opening any malware, you know, getting a ransomware attack right in your inbox. Now you can make sure that you're more you know, protected through, you know, your different types of tools, your endpoint detection response. Now this adds just another layer. And this is why we talk about cybersecurity defense in depth. This is in depth. This is another layer of approach to help protect your your environment, your system, and your users. So now we want to talk a little bit, and as you guys know, this we're just going to briefly go over uh, some of the cyber security threats uh, that are generally top of mind of like myself and probably you guys as well. Right? You look at you know cybersecurity threats. Watch your email, your files, your colleagues. Uh, you guys are probably seeing a lot of times when you get phishing attacks, right? Where you're seeing that. They could be spoofed or they could actually be the individuals that they've had their, their emails compromised, right? So of malware delivered via email, they're saying roughly it's about 94%. 
uh, file-based attacks using Office, PDF, and, and archives, 90%, and involved internal attackers behind the attacker uh, attacks is around 30, 34%. So you see the biggest number right there, and we're seeing this. Uh, different types of attacks with with malware, phishing attacks, around 94% stuff that we have to be aware of. So something that we're all keeping in mind and we're keeping their ear, ear you know, on the, into the ground, you're looking at cybersecurity awareness training, you're looking at different tools to be able to uh, protect the, the files and the data to scan as they're going through. So this is just another tool to be able to do that. Uh, so plenty of cybersecurity products for Office 365, however, um, You've got Microsoft Exchange Online Protection and Advanced Threat Protection. You've got uh, multiple antivirus sandboxing, data loss prevention, threat intelligence, intrusion detection, uh, configuration ver verification, uh, anti anti phishing, spam protection, SPF, DKIM, DMARC, and attack simulation. So you know those are all things that you, you're going to configure on your your you know your exchange server things along that line your dns to make sure that it's a secure email that's coming through that you can't be uh you ghosted that these the your, the email that's coming is actually from a valid valid validated in, uh, email address right so all of us are looking at doing that and implementing these type of strategies right and then you look at microsoft uh, 365 is still vulnerable and then we, we provide a forbes article on Microsoft Office 365 accounts attacked uh, under attack. Reaches from Barracuda Networks uh, have found that the hackers are targeting Microsoft Office 365 accounts with the, uh, worrying degrees of success. We also know about the exchange that just been compromised just recently. So they're all undergoing and all organizations that are at threat and at risk of attacks. It's just how are people, you know, what's the threat vector and how are they attacking them? Right. And then Gardner recommended considering uh, CDR to raise the bar. Uh, CDR can be used as a supplement or replacement for a networking network sandbox. And then this tool right now, you look at when you look at all right content disarm and and reconstruction. Most companies are looking to do that because they want the integrity of the file to be able to not be like uh, just a PDF, but you know if it's a Word document, if it's Excel document, you want to be able to edit it and send it back to the clients because maybe you're working on a project. Well, if it makes it if it flattens it to a PDF, then you can't edit it now. You have problems. You have to go back and forth and make changes. So it's a lot harder for end users that are working. So we're trying to get a system or a solution that's convenient for users to be able to use and stay on their day-to-day -day routine and, and, and activities and tasks that they're able to do. So to walk through how it works, right, disarming comes attachment with an o, uh, the Odex True CDR engine, right? So an instant looking file, right, goes in, you start to see you got an image, text, Excel graph, code, link, right? The CDR then scans it, goes through it, right? and you can see the difference with the image, the text, Right, you got Excel graph, right? Then if it has to disarm it, right? It can disarm it if there's any code, right? And then what happens is as it goes through, it, it actually cleans it, sanitizes it, and then sends it over, right? And it makes sure if there's anything that's clickable, it makes it, you know, it strips out the, the URL. So that actually helps to, you know, disarm the actual file that if there's any scripts to it, that people are not clicking on it. If they have to go to a, a natural site, they're going uh manually and click in so if it's uh they're looking at a news article they're actually going like in for canada maybe it's um cctv or, or city tv they're going directly to that versus clicking on the link which then there could be lines of code behind it that's actually malware uh so you can see through that process then what happens is they actually end up getting a clean file that they're able to use the malware free so that's the process how o odex true cdr works uh, let me know if you guys have any questions. I mean, pretty straightforward. I th I'm sure you guys are pretty, you know, familiar with how this works. Uh, but let me know if you guys have any questions. So there are different solutions. They have a cloud email security supplement. Uh, and then they have, you know, they just the value proposition of the, the application. You can see there's different solutions out there. Uh, what you can see is like you got the SEG uh, secure email gateway. Uh, you got other CDRs. You got uh, EOP, e ATP, ODEX, and then why is it important? Right, thirty percent of uh, cyber attacks involve internal employees. Internal emails can also include malware. You've got SMTP relay uh, solutions uh, require advanced MX records configuration, and that's where you see when the DKI, DK records and things along that line. 
uh, native uh, effect to the MS senders uh, security capabilities. Sandboxing's failed to detect zero day attacks. So something that all of us know is when you look at virus definitions and, and these different definitions, they only work unless they actually have the current threat, right? And they'd be able to test it, write a definition to it, and then update the sandbox to be able to, to recognize it and catch it right through the sandbox. But if they're not, then what happens is they can get right through. All right, then you look at nested files are common uh, vectors of attack, often by uh, bypassing security solutions to infiltrate the organization's network. And then highly configurable policy options allow uh, for fine grain, uh, grain policy definitions. So when you look at this, you know we're all working on policies and procedures in cybersecurity. Right, it's so important for us to look at securing the environment in that sense that you're looking at strong security policies in place. Right, administ administrative controls, technical controls to make sure that there's a granular level of security, right? And then depending on the department, the organization, if it's HR, if it's finance, the more security that you're going to have to make sure that they're protected from any potential attacks, right? That are going to happen to the, that division. Because as you know, people are starting to attack different individuals because now people are working from home. Right. And now they're looking at, you know, how can we compromise them at the, on their home network? So, again, if they're using an exchange server, this will help with security as well. Um, and then, yeah, product overview, you look at how email comes in through email exchange, right, through Office 365. So the SMTP goes through, right, the Microsoft 365 API that goes through, looks at the file, uh, looks at the app and flow manager. Then the CDR service takes over, starts to look at cleaning the file. Uh, the firewall and min console will then actually update and if there's any threats. And then it'll go back through and you can see it go up to the sanitized right, attachment and then it sends out to the user. Then the user actually has that sanitized file. So again, pretty straightforward. I don't think there's any anything that you guys do not know. Uh, but again, this is a newer solution that's out there. Uh, I love you guys just to take a look at and just let me know your feedback. Let me know what you guys think of it. Uh, a second here. And then here's the console so you guys can see what it looks like, right? So if you wanted to go on the dashboard for the intuitive management console, it looks at your content, looks at what's been disarmed, policies, description, users, right? Potential users that have been uh, affected. Right? And then you can go through and you look at, you know, the amount of attacks that you've had, like 795, no, 794 four, uh, with attachments, 68 uh, no attachments, 17 were sanitized. 817 not sanitized, five suspicious, 32 blocked, right? So you can kind of go look at your statistics and you can look at your, your potentials of attack as well. If you're, you see the numbers starting to increase, you can see if there's potential issues, be it increase in phishing tax to your organization that you now you have to look out. Maybe you have to set more rules. Uh, maybe you have to work with ODEX to be able to look at, you know, different virus definitions and maybe even look at zero day attacks that are coming in that you're seeing more and more emails come in from a certain provider that you have to block that. And I'll use example. We all see this Gmail, right? We all see these Gmail accounts come on because these guys can create Gmail accounts over and over again. But maybe there's a string of code or string of words they're using that you can start to block. So different types of uh, security uh, protection methods you could use. And then yeah, when we're looking through this, you can see, uh, just give me a second here, go back, uh, the process, right? When you look at, you know, Microsoft Office Outlook, you look at an email attachment, and then it could have a URL embedded, right? And it goes to the user's box, type of site, it goes through the type, the size, the user, dynamic content, right? And it looks through all the, you know, the policies and validations to see what it can and cannot do. And then depend, de uh, depending on the, if it gets approved all, with, all the way through the process, then it'll be approved to go through the user's um, mailbox. If it's not, then it'll be blocked. So you got filter embedding activity content, forest file type policies and nesting files, disarmed content, and password protected uh, files. So you look at all these different levels of security and things that are going on. Uh, give me a second here. And then, yeah, then they were showing here through their presentation that you can actually have the embed file that's a firewall uh, for Exchange Online, so you can easily download the API and, it, and then embed it, install it. Um, give me a second here. And then from there, you've got your email uh, client. You see email exchange uh, example of block file, and it goes through and it kind of shows that, you know, suspicious uh, attach was removed. And then you got your file. Uh, 
you've got your firewall new pages. So as you're going through, uh, you, you can see the difference between you know the file firewall partner with uh, US, the file wall and the firewall. So it kind of goes through how it's cleaned it and then it tells you, it labels it of uh, the file of what actually it is. So what you're seeing right now, as you can see, it's been cleaned by file wall. And then you can see the difference of it. You can see that, hey, look, you know what? These are clean files. I, I'm able to open it. So going through the education process of your, your users, right? As you go through cybersecurity awareness training, you can, you can train them that if the file comes in, if it doesn't have the extension or the, the title file wall, then maybe it's not, it hasn't been secured, right? So don't open it. Make sure that you uh, contact IT and, and let them know that it hasn't been secured. And then you look at the target market is growing. Microsoft uh, Office 365 users in, in millions. You look at 60, 85, 120, and I think it's more. It's increasing more as we look at, you know, the remote for, uh, work from home uh, clients. The more you know, business and organizations that have gone to remote cloud solutions. Right? You're starting to see them use more of these tools to be able to you know, connect with their users and use Teams, use Office, you know, 365 for collaboration and, and, and meetings. So we're starting to see the real increase there. And so it's so important to look at your security posture and what you need to do right now. Uh, next, you look at, you know, firewall, go, go to market strategy. So they have uh, different solutions here. They have uh, the fire, file wall, uh, Microsoft market, uh, Marketplace, and right? so Microsoft App Source, Microsoft Azure, uh, different uh, different Microsoft partners. You can see some of the ones they work with Ingram, and right? they work with you know InnerWorks Cloud, and they have some different resellers. And then look at you know different ways you can sell. They have great reviews. And then you look at the difference between uh, ODEX, SAS, and uh, Milestones. So currently, right now, uh, they've gone to Outlook, they've gone to Teams, and on OneDrive. And then in 2023, they're going to look at SharePoint, Gmail, and and uh, Drive. So as they're going through and they're out, they're evolving their system. You can see they're starting to evolve now. It's good to see that the Gmail and Google Drive. Again, again, when you look at different education systems, uh, some of them are using Google as their email platform, uh, G Suite. So seeing that they're being diverse, that just just not Microsoft's uh, products, but uh, it looks like in the next two years they're going to be into both the Office 365 Microsoft environment as well as Google. So uh, summary, Firewall is the only Microsoft 365 native app uh, for CDR, uh, malware prevention, enhanced solution for Microsoft o o EOP and ATP. Uh, seamless true CDR processing ensures that file functionality is not degraded and uh, active channel uh, proposition. So not a bad solution. Uh, if you guys want to have more information, go to odex-x.com. Check them out. Uh, and yeah, let me know if you guys have any questions. So James, what do you think? I think FileWall could be a very good service. Uh, I mean, everybody is concerned nowadays with the CASEL guidelines and the thread of ransomware or any other type of online scam by simply clicking a link. If there was the ability to uh, flush out that system and create the securities required, this could turn into really uh, quite good software as a solution for Microsoft. Uh, good things to come and looking forward to what those changes may bring. Well, what I'm seeing as well is when you look at the defense in depth, you know, this layer approach of looking protection, right? you look at protecting the user from their own data, right? And the data is coming in through email. Now it just has that next layer that they can scan the data, make sure it's secure. And as they're trying to click on it, it's not, you know, it doesn't have any malware embedded and they, they can be confident when they click on a PDF, Excel document, a word document, there's not malware because it's been scanned right now. Don't get me wrong. It's 95% or 90%, right? I mean, when you look at zero day attacks, you never know, right? You don't know until it actually happens that there is actually a malware in it that because it's past everything, but at least everything is mainstream right now. At least I think right now this will help to have that layered approach. I think anything like this will become a layered approach and a great start to bring in this kind of change. 
Uh, I mean, outside of all the attacks Canada and the U.S. have currently been going on with cybersecurity threats and different risks, uh, every little bit of help from different corporations, uh, such as Odex and other companies, uh, including Uzado and, and other key companies in the TCU Alliance, everybody is trying to do their part in order to engage the right steps so we can get through this together. For sure. No, it totally makes sense. So yeah, let's bring on our next speaker, Michael. I think he's ready to, to go. Uh, hey, Michael, how you doing? I think you might be still on mute. Yeah, I think you're definitely on mute. Yeah, well, So why he kind of figures out his audio. So yeah, I think I think one of the things we have to look at when you look at the evolution of the cloud and the solution, I think I think what what, what you're finding right now is different technology and different solutions really come down to at the end where you have to look at protecting the users at their home. What do you think, James? I think that's completely accurate information, uh, but not only there, we have to protect our uh, corporations, we have to protect our work environments, and now with COVID, we have to make certain that when people are going to be third-party locations, that every one of those areas are being protected properly and being secured, so none of our work persons or other people around the world are unprotected. Right. We need to step up our game. Yeah, and I think that's so important right now. It's you know when you look at cybersecurity, defense, and death, is we're always leveling up. You got it, Michael. Are you good to go? Oh, we're just gonna get him to do just a quick test. I'm gonna get him to come out and come back in. It seems like his microphone just. Uh... Maybe uh, timed out. But yeah, I, technology. <laughs> oh yeah. How you doing, Michael? Can you hear us? Okay. No, he's he's still muted. Yeah, seems like his microphone is. We did have this working earlier. Yeah. So yeah, you guys have any questions, please let us know uh, while we're just kind of get Michael's uh, audio fixed. Uh, I'm going to mute and I'm going to give him a call and try to walk him through it. Sure. Yeah. Give him a call. So guys, yeah, if you, if you guys want to uh, get, let, ask us any questions, let me know uh, about the cybersecurity industry, what, what's been going on. Uh, what we'll see in the in the interim, uh, Brandon is very informative. Bring this on here. So Brandon is very informative uh, presentation about the f uh, firewall. <laughs> yeah, it's firewall, not firewall. We made that mistake earlier. Currently, I'm I'm learning in it on my course. I probably got got pretty good clarification on how it works and what advantage it has. So yeah, so remember it's file wall, not firewall. Now we were making that mistake a little bit earlier. Um, you know, calling it the wrong thing, right? Uh, firewall is something that's at the in internal external environment that protects traffic from coming in. Firewall is actually looking at the files, right? So it's breaking that down. So just so we're both on the same page. Um, so James is asking here, uh, bring this up here. James, good question. What do you recommend for newbies? Now, are you asking about cybersecurity training? Are you asking about certification? Uh, let me know. Uh, again, when it comes to cybersecurity uh, training, I always recommend if you're first getting the field, Security Plus. Uh, I always recommend you start off with uh, Security Plus and then kind of work your way through, right? So Security Plus is really a kind of a good one to get an introduction when it comes to cybersecurity. And then from there, what you want to do is get that knowledge, 
get that education, get that certification, because that opens the doors for you, especially with the gatekeepers and, and different organizations that are looking for uh, cybersecurity professionals, SOCs, uh, gen level, level one analysts. They're looking for someone with security plus. If you're looking at, I don't know if you're in the States, but the DOD kind of looks at that as a baseline too. So something to think about on that line. Start with there. And then depending on which path you want to go, uh, let me know. How are we doing, Michael? Looks like you're on mute as well, James. Okay, yeah, so you're in Canada? You there, James? There we go. See, we're going to Michael back. Hey, Michael, how's it going? Yeah, it looks like he's still work, trying to work on his audio. Is that, can you hear me now? There we go. Oh, wow. Technology at its finest. Perfect. So <laughs> what I'm going to do is bring up your presentation here. And whenever you're ready, I'll get you started. Okay. Uh, as long as you can hear me, I'm ready. Yeah, you're good. You're good to go. Okay. So, uh, James and Brandon, thank you very much for uh, allowing us to participate uh, tonight. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. And uh, we're happy to give you a little bit of background on SliceUp and what we're doing as related to cybersecurity. Uh, and the reason we're here is we understand the value in log data or machine generated data when it comes to cybersecurity. And that's really our forte is taking what is semi-structured data that's available in logs or available in machine generated rated data and turning that into structured data for use when it comes to cybersecurity. Uh, we understand that they're, they're typically those log files and that machine data uh, while generated by machines is more often than not created for human consumption. So it's usually for somebody to, to understand the message that's being sent, be it log data or machine data, uh, create alerts or do some analysis on that. And we, we understand that translating that to uh, machine usable data is, is important, especially as you look at the direction in which cybersecurity is moving. And that's uh, really in the machine and deep learning worlds. Um, but obviously one of the challenges of that, as in just about every environment where you're using this data, is getting clean data from this semi-structured logs, machine-generated data is difficult. Um, formats change, content is different. Um, even when people are trying to, it makes it worse when people are trying to hide their activities within the machine data and trying to uh, make it look like it's normal data when it's not bringing that data into a machine learning pipeline is challenging. Uh, creating the manual parsers and keeping up to date with how all that data should be parsed so it can become structured data is a very inefficient and uh, typically challenging effort. Um, it's typically not the core competency of somebody who is trying to use that data for cybersecurity purposes. So uh, our goal is to solve that problem. Um, another big issue is in the, when you're looking at data, machine generated data, having access to all of the information is really important. If you miss a little bit of data, you don't know if you've missed a cybersecurity threat, um, be it from a firewall log or an IDS or IPS. So um, the keeping track to ensure that everything you're, it, that's happening, you are seeing uh, is a very important component. And on top of all of that, it's very, very expensive to start storing all the logs, all the machine generated data for the purpose of doing some analysis. Uh, and, and we at SliceUp understand that that challenge needs to be addressed. So what we've done is we've created a, a streaming ingestion mechanism. Uh, it's a, an algorithm on top of some, uh, some proprietary software that allows the system to automatically create parsers from semi-structured data. Uh, it's essentially the ability to convert that semi-structured data to structured data for use in machine learning pipelines. And it's all automated, no human intervention. 
I uh, don't need people to write regex or grok. It's all done automatically. And again, so that uh, those who need the data can focus on using the data as opposed to preparing the data for its use. Uh, we've got uh, a lot of support from industry, those who are deep into the cybersecurity world. Um, they understand that what we're doing makes it way easier for them to do their jobs. And by uh, providing a, the ability to do the automatic parsing, again, the focus on the core competencies is, is what's truly important. So just real quick, let me describe to you in a little more detail how the slice up system works. Uh, we have a, a, a UI that allows our users to drill into the specifics of what the system is seeing. And again, it's a streaming process. The ingestion engine and all of the uh, log parsing is done automatically in a streaming fashion. Uh, it's as in motion. We don't wait for the data to, um, to rest because it's almost too late at that point. So the way the system works is the customers will point their logs to slice up via syslog or a Kafka topic. The system will automatically ingest a log message or log file and determine if it's seen that particular log file before it looks at the structure of the log file. If it hasn't done so, it will automatically create a template, a parser for that particular type of log. And then it will use that particular parser to handle all future versions of that log message. So the system itself keeps track of the templates it's created, and it keeps track of which logs it's parsed with which template. So the one of the additional benefits the system provides is it only stores data from logs where there is variable information. So a, a log itself is just typically made up of some static parts and some variable parts. And the static parts are static in the template. The variable parts get assigned as variables by slice up. And the system only needs to store the variables from each log as a log is being ingested and parsed. It doesn't need to store the entire raw log because the template is saved and the information from the individual log can always be recreated at any time, having the reference between the template and the parsed variables. So there's an inherent uh, benefit in terms of storage requirements to, uh, for, as compared to handling raw logs. Uh, we've seen upwards of 80, 85% reduction in terms of the storage needs to store all this raw log data. Again, it's all done in motion as opposed to at rest. Uh, so you don't, it's not like you're putting it into a database first and then you're getting this reduction. You get the reduction prior to it going into any storage at all. So from a cost perspective, that being one of the big issues, uh, SliceUp has that, uh, that inherent compression in terms of the data needs. So let me show you a little bit more about how the system does what it does. So this is an example in the SliceUp UI of a, a log file. This one happens to be a, a Surrey catalog that the system had received. So this particular log file was received by the system. It's a pretty standard log. And what the system did is, as I mentioned, that if it was the first time that it saw this particular log, it will determine what the structure of the log is. In reality, it takes two of these logs to create the template or the parser because the system doesn't know which parts are static and which parts are variable without seeing a couple logs. But once it's seen the couple logs, it then creates the template based on the structure of the log, which parts stay the same and which parts change. And so you can see that in this particular Surrey catalog, there's a time. Looks this particular log, so the system took these three numbers and assigned them number variables, uh, an alphanumeric for this uh, TCP v4, um, and then so on. The the system is is always looking. Oh, I may have dropped. Yeah, we we got, you, got you back on. All right, sorry about that. I don't yep. know the connections. Okay, so the system is always looking through the entire log and creating the parser so that uh, this template is automatically created. And you can see how it works based on this particular log example. 
And once that template has been created, then as I mentioned, the system knows how to parse this log and break it apart between the static and variable components of the log. And all of the variable data gets put into a table of parsed data. So immediately upon ingestion, we are, the system is automatically taking the semi-structured data, converting it to structured data, putting it into a database, which then can be fed via Kafka topic or an API to any downstream systems that are need to be used for machine learning models, for alerting, um, any operational down, downstream systems can all be fed with this data. Within the slice up system, we do give users the ability to manage some of the field names. They can create aliases because the system is automatically creating these names on its own, as well as categorize templates because it may be useful from a, an analysis standpoint to have groupings of templates that are related to the same topic. So it's a, like I said, a fully automated, no human intervention method to break apart log files, quickly identify the static and variable parts, and make it easy to then use that data in a streaming fashion before it becomes stale, before it's no longer needed. So one of the additional challenges that most people experience when dealing with logs, uh, especially when people are purposely trying to hide information within logs, is the log formats change. Even if you nail a parser, if you got it down cold and uh, it's working great, any change to the log file and the format will break the parser, data will get lost, uh, logs will start stop flowing through, alerts will stop working, your machine learning models get messed up. So it becomes a, a major challenge to deal with those types of uh, normal changes that happen to logs. Uh, and usually it's a data engineer's role to, to create these parsers and to maintain the parsers and to ensure the data is flowing properly. But what the slice up system does is it maintains the versions of templates for you so you don't have to do that which ensures that you have a constant flow of the correct data for use in all the downstream systems. So the way the system handles the different versions of logs that are uh, being sent and modifications to templates, uh, this is actually a really good example. So the, the number one template here at the bottom was created based on several logs that the system had seen to that point. But what happened was this word modify ended up changing to the word view in more recent logs. So the system was able to identify the fact that it could change this word modify to a variable, go back and insert the word modify into that variable for all the previously parsed logs that it had seen to this point. And now it could use version two of the template to parse all the logs. And then what happened was this YXSU showed up at the end of the log, which was used to be CURI. The system did the same thing, realized that it could insert a variable here in replacement of the static text CURI. And now the system was on to version three of the template. And this version then could handle every version of the log that it had seen to this point, regardless of whether it was sent in uh, one, two, or three uh, template. And then this data, in the table now is accurate. All the data integrity is maintained for all of the previously parsed logs, whether it was version one, two, or three. And, and it becomes a fail safe mechanism to ensure that as logs are being ingested and as machine data is being sent to slice up, that it's automatically parsing and automatic, automatically keeping track of when the changes are occurring. If the log format changes significantly from the previous version, the system will just create a brand new template and continue to parse all that data. So logs don't get lost. They don't end up in some unknown bucket that somebody has got to go find and then figure out how to, to create a new parser for. So the, the end result of all of this is that out of the box, SliceUp provides this immediate business value. Again, there's no, no human intervention uh, the system doesn't require any training, doesn't require anybody to input any configurations. It's just a matter of installing the system and start sending logs. The um, 
the onboarding of machine data occurs automatically. The, the benefit that can be seen to the data engineers, those responsible for cleaning the data and making it usable by the downstream systems is very substantial. Um, you know, to, to this quote, and I think it seems to be pretty prevalent in industry that when it comes to the, the data science world, about 80% of the time is, is used actually preparing the data. When in fact, the, the uh, teams are much better served if the data can be prepared for them and apply their time to the, the data science and the machine learning needs. Uh, the, in, uh, the need for the data governance to ensure that there's no loss of data is critical. And again, to, to top it all off, SliceUp has the inherent ability to reduce the storage needs for all of the raw log data. So instead of storing as much as possible in a database, doing the analysis once it's at rest, uh, SliceUp is able to do all of that in process, as in motion, and on a streaming fashion, and save in the neighborhood of 80, 85% in terms of storage needs. Uh, to handle all that kind of data. So it's uh, if there's any questions or anybody has any uh, anything I can clarify, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Um, but we I appreciate everyone's time. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Michael. Yeah, that was that was great. So how would we use this right now in, in our environments? Because I know you got Sims, you got all this. How are we using this right now? So um, it's sort of the, the pre-processing of data for any system that is looking at log data, machine data. Um, no matter what the system is, there has to be some sort of either, you're either doing ad hoc searches or you're doing some pre-processing on your own, you're writing parsers, whatever it might be. Slice up can be ingested into a pipeline, do all of the pre-processing of data, turn it into structured data, and then it can feed all of those existing downstream systems. Okay. And what would be like your, your competition right now? Like what would most people, if they're going to go, you know, what would Slice compare to right now for what they currently use or are looking at? So uh, most every log aggregation system, those that are dealing with logs, uh, they make you write manual parsers and maintain manual parsers to actually use the data. There are some systems that will do the sort of the data parsing when you are doing your searches. Um, but, and, and some, some uh, platforms can only use standard kind of, excuse me, standard kind of logs. And there, there are typical common parsers for those. Um, but when you, when you have custom logs or in the world of cybersecurity, when somebody's trying to make a log look like it's custom or looks like it's standard, but it's really custom, um, and they're trying to, to hide a change that they're making to, to send some data, all of those parsers end up breaking, which is the reason you have more and more different systems that people are trying to incorporate to try to provide that security. So SliceUp is really doing all that pre-processing for you without the need to maintain all that stuff manually. Okay. Now, what would be your ideal environment, like a SOC environment that these guys are looking at these logs, you know, so you'd be looking at a SOC uh, that has a SIM, a solution that's in that they would try to put this in, in over and above their yeah. current alien vault, uh, Q radar, rapid seven. Yes. So it would be prior. So typically those are getting logs. Um, we, whatever mechanism the, the logs are being received by those, um, those platforms. SliceUp could be inserted prior to that, or it can be mm -hmm. run sort of as a sidecar if you didn't want to um, possibly alter the current processes that are in place and then fed back into those systems. Okay, okay. Now, how do you see this evolving, like I know, and in, in comparison to like the AI technology and the stuff that's coming out that's supposed to be streamlining these processes that uh, I know some of these now, these solutions are coming out that it's supposed to be doing all this for you, that you're getting cleaner logs, you know, you're getting less false positive, false negatives, right? And more clear, clean data. So there's kind of the, the two schools of thought. There's the logging for intent, um, where the expectation is that people are doing a better job of structuring their logs and maintaining the structure in their logs and keeping it consistent and 
and letting all the downstream systems know when their log formats are going to change so people have the opportunity to change their parsers and make sure that their platforms themselves are not breaking. Mm -hmm. um, and that's great if you can maintain that. But in our experience, it's, uh, it's usually a big lift to ensure that everybody's doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and, and you need something to make sure you're capturing those logs that fall out of the parsers. Even if you're 99% perfect, which hasn't happened in my experience in terms of uh, writing, uh, of, of producing your logs in the right format, there's still some that are dropping out. And when it comes to security, you know, there's usually the view of trying to find the the path in that nobody's paying attention to or nobody um, has a means to really detect. And if there's some some hole there in the security or some hole in terms of the data that's being handled or needed for security, then uh, that's typically found and that would be something that SliceUp would resolve. Right, okay, no, it totally makes sense. Anything else that we might have missed that you think that, that you know these security professionals might need to know? Uh, I don't think so. I think the, you know, what, what we're a, a relatively new startup. Um, and the, the key capability that we have is really to make uh, and turn the data into uh, usable data, the structured data. And mm -hmm. so it's really, that, that's our, our, our mission uh, has applicability in many cases, but in the security world, we realize that there's a big need to ensure that you're not losing any data. There isn't anything just you know slipping by or some logs or, or falling out of parsers and then you're not paying attention to them. So you know, the alerts break and everything breaks downstream if the data doesn't get into the right place. And that's the part that we need to resolve. Right, no, totally makes sense. Yep. Uh, so what's the, are you channel through partnership or direct to consumer? Like if a, if a client wants to kind of look at your solution? So uh, we have, we're direct to consumer right now. We're working mm -hmm. on some channel sales. Uh, we have some partners who are extremely interested in what we're doing because they realize it solves a, a huge problem on their own or for them. Um, but right now we're a direct to consumer, mostly kind of the mid small to mid sized businesses where there's an opportunity to improve upon solutions that they're currently using. Um, and again, you know, most organizations that, uh, that aren't really large don't have the personnel to, to really keep track of all of this stuff. If we can solve the problem for them, then they can apply their core competencies to their, their expertise, which is more on the, the security as opposed to the data preparation. No, totally makes sense. Yeah, uh, if anybody is, is interested, they can definitely reach out to us. They can get our information from our website. Uh, more than happy to, to have discussions with people and see how we can help them out. Perfect. Just going to jump James back in here. Hey, James, did you have any questions? No, I think you've pretty much answered them all. But uh, thank you very much, Michael, for coming out this evening and uh, presenting for us. Thank very you. Very informational. Yeah, we, we appreciate the opportunity. And uh, I'm glad we were able to get the technical issues worked out. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Good. Yeah. It's, it's always those things, you know, expect the <laughs> unexpected, right? Exactly. We're all, we're all in the IT world. We get that, you know, things happen. Uh, yeah. So guys, if you guys have any questions, anyone that's watching us on Twitch, YouTube, on Facebook, uh, let us know if you have any questions. If you, you're you on Facebook, go to YouTube. Uh, you can actually go through the chat there. You see a lot of communication and, and conversations happening. Um, Michael, wh where do you see the cybersecurity industry going in the next six months with everything that's going on? Where do I see it going in the next six months? Uh, <laughs> That's a, an interesting question. I'm probably not the foremost cybersecurity expert, mm -hmm. but I do know that with the access to clean data, it makes it much easier to apply some of the machine and deep learning techniques. Um, and so I would love to say that the, that's the near term solution mm -hmm. uh, or near term direction. Um, and, and we're hoping to help in that regard. So um, we were familiar with and have partnered with uh, other organizations in the cybersecurity world, and, and they're all trying to move in that direction. It's just making sure you've got the the data you need to create all those models uh, to handle those those zero day attacks and, and the you know the, the APT type threats. The, getting that data and having it accessible when you need it is the challenge. Right. Hope yeah, everyone right. six months. 
Yeah. I mean, that's good. I mean, I wanted to kind of see, like, like you said, like you're, all of us have our own niche in the industry. It's good to kind of see your perception because I mean, we all see different in different ways, right? When you're yep. looking at data logs, you're looking at, looking at clean data, you're looking at, you know, monitoring and making sure that there's constant, uh, the evolution of getting clean monitoring and making sure they actually have the data to be able to look at protecting the environment right? and how that's so important. I know James is, you know, military defense in depth. Myself, I work with, you know, uh, different types of organizations, uh, commercial. I mean, we're all looking at it from different areas, but at the end of the day, I mean, with the pandemic and everything that's going on, there's just so much happening right now from companies going, you know, spread out wide with their employees right now working from home to now we're seeing more and more attacks. You got solar winds. Uh, Molson just got compromised. I mean, it just keeps going on and on and lar these larger organizations, right? And no fault that them, I mean, they're, they're doing their due diligence. It's just the attacks are increasing. Well, I, the attacks are increasing. And I think those who are attacking are, um, are able to find the holes in the defense um, maybe a little bit easier or maybe they're just trying harder or whatever it is. But if, if we can provide the clean information as to what's going on in all those individual transactions as they are flowing, and that information can be provided for those who are trying to, to you know, give the defense, then I think it's, uh, it's, it's just, the, it's our mission and, and it's really where we think we can provide some benefit. Right. And then uh, we just got a message here. I'm actually going to bring in Dave here. He was actually sending out a, a link. Uh, yeah, Dave, you want to turn on your camera again? Uh, he was just actually sending out an article, and I'll share it out to you guys as well. Uh, President Biden's new executive order could oblige software vendors to tell Uncle Sam about security breaches. So I'll share that article out with you guys so you guys can see that. Uh, but it's important to, right, to keep your ear to the ground. So, Dave, did you have a chance to read that? Yeah, it just came in now. It's uh, it's before Biden for signature. He has not signed it yet, but basically anytime <clears throat> any software company, so far it's only software companies, who are selling to the U.S. government and have any sort of security breach, they must inform Uncle Sam immediately or right. face consequences. So this is uh, Biden's trying to, you know, the, soft, the solar winds calamity started this whole thing. We know this. And uh, basically, he's about to sign this bill into effect, and it just came out about, uh, well, our time about 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago. But I think they already have different orders that are out there that they're supposed to be, you know, you know, informing real breaches and things along that, especially when the loss of data. I don't know, in Canada, we've got uh, Pipita, and, you know, in the United States, you got California laws, New York has one. Yep. All of them are supposed to be reporting the, uh, their breaches. He's trying to make it federally and an immediate report, not this. Oh, well, six months ago, you know, like this is what I was reading before he even brought this out. I knew this was coming. Uh, but if he does it, you know what's going to happen. It's just going to go around the world. Um, somebody is. Oh, my camera's on? No, my camera's on. Camera's You're late, on. James. <laughs> Uh, anyways, yeah, this is interesting. I monitor probably 10 or 12 different channels every single day and tell Uncle Sam just popped up as I was listening to uh, to uh, the presentations, and I went, what? So I did read it. Um, but, I mean, even uh, Berkeley, University of uh, Southern California, Berkeley just confirmed they got hacked and they lost data. And uh, it's just every single day I see one or two massive announcements about – Breaches and loss of data, and the data is being used. And uh, I mean, like even, even, uh, well, Facebook, Facebook is saying, yeah, we lost 533 million, uh, you know, phone numbers and personal data is leaked online. But you know, yeah, well, it was a year ago, and I guess we're finally telling you now, so that's not going to be allowed. Right. So. Yeah, I mean. It's ongoing, right? And this is where we're having the conversation around cybersecurity, just making sure that everyone's looking at protection. Mm -hmm. there, there's so much going on right now. There's in the news again today. North Korean hackers are creating false websites, fake company offerings, and stuff to attract uh, uh, security researchers. Then go after them. Anybody's in the research like us, you know, they're attacking us now personally, trying to 
trying to get data and trying to get the information. So be aware and, uh, you know, but um, all our stuff is not on the net. <laughs> it's that simple. We're old school. We have computers that have no connection to the outside world. Right, which is good. That's the only way we can do it. In fact, there's no USB, no no way of taking the data off the server. So it's all it's all locked in. And, uh, you know, like I hate to say it, but that's the old school way of doing it. But, yeah, I bet you Biden will sign that within the next couple of days. So it's, it's I'm trying to find out what the fines are going to be. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think there was per what uh, the last one I heard was per record, right? Oh, thank you. Yes. Thanks, James. Uh, races on to build quantum proof encryption. Well, guess what? If somebody wants to loan me a computer, I'll prove that CEW is quantum proof. We know it's quantum resilient. So that's the next article you, uh, James was just the, talking yeah, about. Yeah, just put it up. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I decided to post that up because that just I just saw that this morning after hearing your uh, presentation, Dave, and understanding the history and what CEW has achieved, I think there is a clear indication that the uh, race is over. Uh, well, it may be in the process of being built, but uh, definitely one company is out of the main gate who has mm -hmm. successfully been able to do this, and that is yours. Um. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, one of the things I did not discuss in the paper, I hope people will go read it, is Dr. Capel also listed the amount of qubits required to break our software, but he also did some more research. I mean, this center is constantly right into everything to do with cybersecurity, and uh, they announced that IBM is going to have a 10,000 qubit machine in less than six years, and that, that's pretty good. But that means RSA 2048 can be broken. He will have enough qubits to break RSA. So that's a concern. Now, again, he says mm, they, they need more grains of sand than they're on Earth to build a, qubit machine, a quantum computer to break our software because it's, it's incredible how many false, false, uh, false positives they will get. But the fact that, you know, in six years we'll have a 10,000 qubit machine, that's scary. So much for RSA. That's all it takes. <laughs> For sure. Okay. Now, Michael, thank you so much. I know you have to take off, but thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, what's the best way for people to get a hold of you? So the uh, best thing is via email, uh, Michael <laughs> at sliceup.co. You can go to our website, sliceup.co. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for including us. And uh, we definitely want to stay connected with you guys. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much, Michael. And thank yeah, let, let us know if there's anything else we can do to help you. Will do. Thank you, guys. Take care. Thanks, Michael. So, Dave, just to let know, your camera's still off. It's on here. I'm looking at myself. <laughs> well, I can. Hey, like I turn it off, turn it back on, and <clears throat> I'm looking at myself in the thumbnail. It's weird. Yeah, you're 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 blacked out. Can anyone else see Dave? Uh, for here, we see you. Kind of. I don't know, James. Can you see him? I see a perfect dark room. That's about it. <laughs> there we go. That's what I see too. Oh. Yeah, no, I have lights on. Believe me, I don't sit in the dark. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. What a, what a day for uh, anomalies. A little technical issues here. It's like the day I went out to the new the Bruce Nuclear uh, uh, facility to shoot some uh, interesting photos, and everything that could go wrong went wrong. Batteries died. Uh, systems wouldn't power up. Uh, uh, operating systems uh, scrambled and started becoming a total different operating system. Not Windows. Uh, yeah, I guess I was getting radiated and I'm pretty heavy, but I'll tell you one thing, the Garga counters never went off. So <laughs> that's always good. Those are what you call, uh, un unknown anomalies. I won't tell you what I was doing up there, but I was uh, on the other side of the shore monitoring the station. <laughs> pretty All right. Cool. This has been a very good evening. Very interesting evening. Uh, Yeah, I think that's been good. I mean, I think we got a lot of great information. Uh, yeah. Again, thank you guys, everyone that's been watching. Uh, let us know if you have any questions. The video is actually going to be uh, you know, recorded and live on YouTube. So if you want to come back and watch it, watch the presentations, Odex, Slice Up, and then just the conversation, what's going on, let, let us know. Uh, we'll have our next presentation uh, in uh, April, May, uh, the first Monday in May. So if you're not subscribed to the meetup group, let us know. Make sure you're subscribed to it so you can get all the alerts of what's going on in the event. Uh, and, and and just uh, follow us on LinkedIn. 
Uh, you can follow Dave, you can follow uh, James and myself on LinkedIn. Uh, and just make sure that you guys are connected with us because we've got a lot of great information. A lot of things are happening over the next 60 days, 90 days of the evolution of technology as well as cybersecurity. Uh, anything else you want to say, James? I would say just keep a good eye on the CEW website and all of the relevant information that is currently coming up on encryption systems. And again, if you want any further information, uh, please just reach out to our team and or TCU Alliance or any one of the three of us here, and we'll be more than happy to help you. Awesome. When's our next meetup? It's going to be the first Monday of May. Okay, so I have a little bit of time, but uh, I'm going to make a, a, an offer in that one. And that is uh, everybody who's listening can get a free copy of our password manager to test it and report back to us what they think. So what I recommend, guys, everyone that's watching, watching, find Dave on LinkedIn and then just message him that, hey, I, I saw you on the on this event, just so he has a kind of a list of everyone that's here. And then when he launches in May, you guys can get the first first copy of it. Yep, we want people to try it and feed it back to us. So uh, you can do that. I'll take care of that. We'll be launching in May. And then uh, during that presentation, anybody on can also get it. I, I want to get 100 people so to try it and get as much feedback as we can. I mean, we've already proven it. We're just extracting it from our uh, our military version. But we want to get it out there for the public to use. And it'll be more of a uh, consumer and small commercial um, use. Um, because uh, in the military grade of the encryption, it's it's much more robust. But uh, I think nobody can memorize 96 characters for a password. So uh, that's why we're bringing that version out for, for commercial and, and consumer. So Awesome. So you guys, I just, uh, I just copied over uh, Dave's URL to his actually uh, social media or LinkedIn profile. So make sure you, you uh, go and subscribe to his channel. Or, or uh, his account. Just give me a second. I want to make sure I have the one. Yeah, I got that one. You there. got it. And those are asking what's my last name. It is Palachik. Palachik. It's Hungarian based. Uh, my father was from Hungary. So Dave Palachik. And uh, yeah, I'm uh, the chief technical officer of uh, CEW and I'm um, an ex IBM uh, computer engineer and um, part time professor at uh, Durham College who now wants to test our software too. <laughs> They've uh, got a center of excellence going. Awesome. Yeah. So guys, make sure you do that. And then, yeah, we look forward to see you guys in May uh, message us. If there's another topic or something you guys want us to cover, uh, we're always open to it. Or if you have someone that wants to speak, let us know as well. Uh, we're looking for experts in the field in different areas in cybersecurity that really making a difference uh, influencers and in technology. So thank you so much. I hope you guys have a great Monday night, James, anything you want to fi uh, finish off with? No, just everyone, please continue to stay safe. We are thinking about you, and uh, we'll see you next month. And thank you very much for joining us this evening. And Brandon, Dave, thank you for uh, being online tonight. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys.